It's been about two months since OFT-2, also known as the Boeing Starliner Orbital Flight Test 2, finally touched down, and everything seemed to go relatively well with this test flight, in spite of some problems with thrusters and a minor issue with life support. So finally, after one problem after another, after one disappointment after another, Boeing seemed to finally be back in the game, but there is a very important consideration that Boeing is going to have a hard time getting over, and just recently, that problem became even worse, as in $93 million worse. Yes, that's how much of a charge NASA imposed on Boeing for even more problems during this test flight, or at the very least, because the test flight was even necessary in the first place, and Boeing has piled up an unbelievable amount of charges at this point that's going to have to come out of their earnings from the very few numbers of Starliner flights that are likely to happen before the retirement of the ISS. So here's the question. Can Boeing really keep such an unprofitable program going, and can they do it well, given the fact that they're probably going to be in the red all the way to the end of the decade? That having been said, there are some positive developments to talk about as well. I've often talked about the difficulties that Starship is likely to have trying to land on the surface of Mars. I've actually called this the SpaceX Starship suicide dive because of the difficulties involved in landing on a planet that has some atmosphere but so incredibly thin that it makes landing a great big challenge that may never be overcome for a human rated spacecraft. However, there have been recent developments with a new type of technology, something that's been talked about before mankind even set foot on the moon that makes this a possibility in the future. And I'm sure a lot of you know that this is a space elevator, and even though many people talk about just how impossible something like this is, well, that may apply to Earth, but it certainly doesn't apply to the Moon or to Mars because of new breakthroughs with different types of materials that could prove very useful to this type of technology and completely change how we plan to expand into the solar system. And we're going to learn Learn all about these new developments in just a moment. So it's been quite some time since I've talked about this particular problem, so I'm going to give you a real quick refresher. Here's the issue. Even though the surface gravity on Mars is only 3.7 meters per second, as opposed to 9.8 meters per second on Earth, Earth's atmosphere reduces terminal velocity down to between 200 to 250 kilometers per hour, which is what we've observed thus far with all of the tests of Star Starship. Now, on Mars, that's a different story entirely. And Starship is not a glider, and even if it was, it wouldn't have large enough wings in order to appreciably reduce its speed through atmosphere this thin. And that's been proven time and again by the tests that we've carried out here on Earth. We're talking about an atmosphere a hundred times as dense here than it is on Mars, and yet the aerobatic qualities of of Starship, or its aerodynamic quality, shall we say, haven't really reduced its terminal velocity by any kind of appreciable amount, and that's incredibly important to managing a successful landing on the Red Planet. This is the only vehicle
vehicle that successfully carried out the whole Starship landing procedure. And once again, that was here on Earth, and it plunged through our atmosphere at a very high velocity, and once again, its aerodynamic qualities didn't really change that velocity by a huge amount. It would change it far, far less on Mars, which means, once again, we'd be looking at a terminal velocity of about a thousand kilometers per hour on the red planet, as opposed to 200 to 250 here. I don't see how the hell Starship can possibly carry out a successful pull-up at the last second maneuver, firing its engines for all they're worth to go from a thousand kilometers per hour down to zero and to make this process safe for human passengers. I do believe that it can be used for cargo to achieve perhaps a 95 or 96 percent success ratio, but to get to a 99.9 percent .9 rate of success, I really don't see this process ever being viable, which means we need another way of setting down on the red planet. And fortunately, as I suggested before, we finally have it. And instead of an Earth space elevator, which is still impossible with our current technology, we would be using a Martian space elevator, although we would start out with what's called an LSC or a lunar space elevator. And it's a long tether connecting the surface of the moon to an Earth-Moon Lagrange point, Lagrange point one probably, which is an average distance of 58,019 kilometers away from the moon and 326,000 kilometers or so away from Earth. And you would also need a counterweight even further away. We're talking about 278,544 kilometers out in order to make the whole thing work and be stable. Now, this may sound completely impossible with today's engineering, but it is not only possible, it's relatively inexpensive and it can be done with existing commercial materials. Now, Kevlar used to be the best bet, but since that time, much better materials have come out, including something called T-1000G, Dyneema, and Xylon, all three of which are available in extremely large quantities. Now, what this would do is allow payloads to be delivered to Lagrange Point 1, where a space station could be placed without having to set down on the moon. The ideal lunar space elevator described in a paper linked in the description would carry six cars or six cargo pods which could climb the tether simultaneously making use of solar power or some other type of power other than rocket fuel in order to make delivering cargo up to the space station far more efficient. We're talking nine times more efficient than using rockets to achieve the same thing. These cars could also be human rated carrying carrying human passengers all the way to Lagrange Point 1 in 17 and a half hours, assuming a cruising speed of one kilometer per second, which is much, much slower than a rocket, but still delivering the human passengers safely and with a lot less fuel consumed than with the traditional method of utilizing rockets. Not only that, Starship requires so much refueling just to get from LEO to lunar orbit or to a space station in lunar orbit down to the moon then back to the space station at that point its tanks are nearly empty whereas if you're using a system like this it can transfer cargo and personnel to a space station in cis lunar space indefinitely an organization called Liftport Group, who by the way created this animation, set up the parameters for the most basic lunar space elevator design, which came in at only 48 tons, which would certainly be light enough to launch on a single Starship, or indeed even a Block 2 SLS, or a Falcon Heavy if it utilized different types of propulsion methods to get it all the way out to the moon. It would be manufactured entirely on 
Earth and assembled for launch into a single package. It would comprise of the Tether, the EML station, which is essentially the space station out at the Lagrange point, the counterweight, the surface attach fixture, and finally the climbers. And as I said before, all of this can be done with existing technology and existing materials. As a matter of fact, a number of new types of materials have recently come available, new forms of graphene, and I have an article linked about that substance as well in the description that makes this process even easier, the tether even stronger, and even lighter. This is technology that we have at our disposal right now. It can't be used on Earth. Earth's atmosphere is far too dense, Earth's gravity and rate of rotation is entirely too high, and also there's way too much space junk in LEO to make this practical. But on the moon and on Mars, this is very doable. Now, in some ways, a Mars space elevator is simpler than a lunar space elevator. It doesn't have to be as long. However, it does have to be somewhat stronger because you're not dealing with something that's sitting out at a very stable Lagrange point. Instead, it's a geostationary space station. And the other end, the counterweight end of the space elevator, comes out at 40,000 kilometers away from the surface of the red planet. Not nearly as long as the lunar space elevator, but still, it has to be a stronger cable, number one, because of rotation, but more importantly, because of the atmosphere. Yes, Mars' atmosphere is very thin, which is what makes this possible in the first place, but still, all of that has to be taken into account. Nevertheless, the materials that I've already described can definitely be used for this purpose. So, the geostationary station would be out at a distance of 20,292 kilometers away from the Martian surface. Now, achieving a speed of one kilometer per second might be a little bit more difficult, at least in the Martian atmosphere, so we'd probably have to reduce the speed down to perhaps a thousand kilometers per hour. However, even if you did that, you would still make the transition time in a little over 20 hours' time. Not bad, really, especially when you consider that you would have several cars transitioning cargo, personnel, etc. on an ongoing basis. Now, the first space elevator would obviously have to be constructed utilizing robots and unmanned starships carrying the necessary equipment and materials down to the Martian surface, and it would get a lot easier once you started making use of in-situ materials. But nevertheless, once you got this system established, it would transition personnel and cargo to and from the Martian surface much more quickly, efficiently, and a lot safer. That's the most important factor than Starship ever could. This is a system that we really should be looking at very seriously, and given Starship's tremendous 100-ton cargo capacity, it makes building something like this a lot easier. However, there is one complication with a Martian space elevator that doesn't exist with the moon, and that is Phobos. This is an animation created by Max Fagan. His channel is linked in the description as well, by the way, and he advocates placing a Martian space elevator at the top of one of these very large Tharsis volcanoes. The atmosphere will be very thin up there, plus you're starting out at a high altitude. But here's the problem. Phobos is between you and the geostationary station in Martian orbit, and every 14 souls or so, you're going to have to maneuver the space elevator and the tether out of the way of this moon to avoid a collision. However, here's the positive side. Tourists traveling on the space elevator at this particular time would get a remarkable view of Mars' moon up close and personal. Yes, you could get 
this close and that's what Phobos would look like from this perspective and speed. Pretty amazing stuff to say the least. So it could become quite a tourist attraction instead of a hazard, assuming that you had a very consistent and reliable process to move the space elevator and the tether out of the way when you have to. Still, there's no reason from an engineering standpoint that that would pre present any sort of challenge, so not a real problem, but rather kind of a positive side to this space elevator. So a much easier, a much safer, and more efficient way of transitioning cargo and personnel, not only from the moon, but also from Mars, utilizing today's technology. We should really get on this a lot more aggressively than we have been up to this point because it can make expanding out into the solar system a lot easier and above all, a lot safer if we're talking about the Starship suicide dive. And oh yeah, here's another benefit. If Starship were docked with a geostationary space station at the end of a space elevator, it would pick up enough additional delta V from centrifugal force in order to achieve escape velocity, which means once it picked up its personnel and cargo from Mars, it could make its way towards Earth without using a drop of fuel, being able to keep whatever fuel it had in reserve for the rest of the journey to speed the process up. Lots of benefits, but let's talk about Starliner now, because I'd really like to rant at the end of this video. Boeing in its second quarter financial results release said that it took another $93 million charge in this quarter from its commercial crew program. Quote, driven by launch manifest updates and additional costs associated with OFT2, unquote. They didn't really elaborate as to what caused this charge and only briefly mentioned it, by the way, on an earnings call. But still, a lot of people were paying attention. And here's the deal with Starliner at this point. It's recorded $688 million worth of charges. It took a $410 million charge in January of 2020 due to its largely unsuccessful orbital flight test mission. It took another $185 million worth of charges after a valve problem delayed the OFT2 launch last August. And then finally, it's taken almost another $100 million worth of charges for reasons that they would prefer not to explain at this point. That is an enormous amount of money. If you consider that Boeing is charging a very large amount of $90 million per seat to NASA for future flights on the Starliner, that means they're only going to gross $360 million per flight, which means it would take two years just to gross the amount of money that they've taken in charges alone. And that's gross, not profit. Most probably it's going to take four years just to turn around all of those charges and all the negatives that Starliner has accumulated. And here's my problem with all of that. If Boeing is trying to cut costs wherever possible on a program that's already bleeding out like a sieve, how safe is it really going to be? Crew Dragon is already turning a substantial profit, and so therefore SpaceX can afford to invest a great deal of effort, time, and money in safety protocols, whereas every extra safety protocol that Boeing has to implement costs them more money and puts them even further into the red. And if you look at Boeing's recent history when it comes to trading safety for cost-cutting measures, well, they don't have a very good track record over the last 20 years. Perhaps they can turn it around with Starliner, but I find that a little difficult to believe with a spacecraft that's going to run in the red by definition for many years to come. Really, I think Boeing will focus a lot more effort on SLS, given the fact that that is not a fixed rate contract, and they can guarantee themselves a lot more profit as opposed to 
Starliner, which is always going to be an unprofitable effort for them, no matter what they do, and that is a recipe for disaster. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support my channel so I can keep this content coming, and as always, stay angry about space!